I want you today to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, and we're just going to look at three verses this morning, 15 through 17. Chapter 5, 15 through 17. I've titled this Thanksgiving Evangelism. Uh, let me uh, share with you this passage. If you follow along with me in your copy of God's Word. Look carefully, then, how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Heavenly Father, we do ask today that in the context of this verse, you have commanded us to walk in love, to, to walk in a way that would show forth love. And Father, we cannot do that because we are dependent upon you for your grace and mercy to, do, to accomplish that feat. Father, the love that you command us to walk in is a supernatural love. Um, left to our own selves, left to our own devices, Father, we would, um, we would struggle. Um, we would fall countless times. But Father, I thank you that you say in your word that a, a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up each time. Father, we get back up because we know that the cross is available for us. We get back up because you are good. We get back up because you deserve thanksgiving a plenty. Lord, help us. Help us this Thanksgiving week to give you what you deserve. Not the, not the world. The world's going to thank other people and other things than themselves. But we as believers in Christ thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, to kind of uh, get you in the right frame of reference for this passage, let me ask you a question. How do you keep a turkey in suspense? How do you, how do you keep a turkey in suspense? Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you at Christmas. Why did the turkey cross the road? It was the chicken's day off. And what did the mother turkey say to her disobedient children? If your father could see you now, he'd turn over in his gravy. Well, okay, that's corny, right? Uh, I, I do not have a job as a stand-up comedian. But the Bible says that Thanksgiving is... One of the things that is the heart of our Christian experience. We have a reason to give thanks. We have a great reason to give thanks. As I said on Wednesday, it said, the Bible says in Psalm 107, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. That, that's a comfort to me. There's nowhere I can go that God's love isn't there. You see, Thanksgiving is, is everything we can give him. Uh, we can give him a lot of things. We can give money to the Lord. and You know, we should. We should give not only a tithe, but over and above that for his kingdom. Because we are thankful. And to the degree we are thankful, we will be givers. And we will give thanksgiving to God. You see, in that psalm it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. It emphasizes the heart of giving thanks. We just don't say thank you. Like when I was a kid and would get socks for Christmas or for birthdays, and I would get socks or shirts, I would tell my mom, 
Thank you. But I would forget about it in the next sec second. Because I really didn't want shirts or socks or sometimes, you know, underwear that my mom, my, really, they, that's what I got. And so I was all ready for the next year of school, they would say. I wanted the toys, you know. But we have a lot to give thankful, thanks to God for. We live in a time that is really dark. We live in a time that it's easy to get down and, and, and not give thanks, not, not realize all the things that you have to give thanks for. And even if you don't have anything to give thanks for today, you can give thanks to God for himself. Because God has given himself to you in the person of Christ Jesus. You see, he created us. And he created us to give thanks. That, that, that is the, it's like the purpose of a light bulb is to do what? To give light. The purpose of mankind is to give thanks to its crea his creator. And when we are down and gloomy, you know, some, some Christians have what I call a um, disinterested gloom or this fog that covers over their head. It's just, it goes wherever they go. There's this cloud. And they're going, oh, woe is me. Life is not fun. My life, life is, I, I'm just beat down all the time. Get, give thanks. Amen. I mean, that's the way you get out of it because when you realize that all the gloom out there and the gloom in the world and the difficulties of the world, you can still give thanks. People are going to ask you about that too. Why does your heart bubble up? And I mean bubble up with thanksgiving. It should. It shouldn't be just a duty. Okay, I'm going to do my duty and give thanks. It should, be, it should be the way that we live. You see, we need to hear what God is saying to us because we live in such difficult times. I, I mean, just think of what's happened in the last 10 years. There's, there's been a worldwide global economic crisis. People have you know, lost jobs. Work has been wiped out. Savings have been wiped out. I, I knew a friend of mine had been saving all their life to retire. And they were a victim of a Ponzi scheme and lost everything. Everything. They lost, I mean, it was tragic. It was one of the biggest Ponzi schemes. Of course, it was in California. But it was, it was, it was huge. You know, someone said, invest in this and you'll do fine. And you, and you know what a Ponzi scheme, someone, someone gets you to give you their money. You give them the, your money and they're supposed to invest it, but they don't invest it. They just pay someone else the thing and then they keep most of it. They never invest it. And so when you call, when everybody calls for the money together, they don't have the money. They've already spent it and have done nothing short of stealing from you. We live in a time of depression. People are down. People get depressed about everything. You look, my wife always says, you turn on the news, and what are they, what, what, what's the first thing you hear about? What, what, who, who died? I know Kennedy was assassinated 50 years ago. I guess Friday in Dallas, Texas. I was alive. I was six months old. So, so I don't really have that etched in my head, but everybody that I talk to has that etched in their heart, where they were, when they heard it, what was going on. It was a time of depression in our country. One writer I read this week says there is a persuasive sense of anxiety as everybody feels that they're on thin ice. And since 9-11, there, 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 there's been a huge increase in the use of antidepressants. You know, gun sales are up. People are amassing cash and gold. And people have lost faith in the institutions. 
of our country. We feel overwhelmed. We feel unsalvageable. And there's no pill that you can take. I can't give you a pill this morning to make you smile. Now, the not notorious church face, we come in, we smile, and we never talk about what's really going on in our heart. But what I want to say today is this. I want to say today is that if you're going to be more optimistic, you got to give thanks. I don't mean that you're, you're going to be like, uh, what was the guy, Norman Vincent Peale that says the power of positive thinking. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a realistic optimism that is based on what God says in his word about your future. Now if your future is without Christ, I would say you would be a realistic pessimist. You should be. Because it's not going to be fun to stand before a holy God who is righteous and just and have him condemn you to an eternity in hell because of your sin. Our verse today, I believe, tells us what we can do. To, because it, it's, in, it's in the context of walking in love for other people, he says these words. And in fact, the, the verse before it, he says, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. When Christ shines, when his radiance is seen, we cannot help but give thanks to God. Our text offers three answers. How do we do it? How do we get our minds and our hearts to where Thanksgiving is just bubbling up? And in order to do that, number one, look what it says in verse 15. It says, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. So the first step is to watch your step. Watch every step you take. The King James says... He uses the old words, walk circumspectly. It has the idea of walking on a narrow path that you're about to fall off. When I, when I was a kid, we would go back into the, what I would call, we, we'd go back into the woods and there was a section, now, now it's all paved over and it's a road. I mean, it's a major thoroughfare now. But right by our house, there was a cement bayou. And back behind it, there was these, all these woods that were never taken care of. We'd go back there for hours and hours. You know, that's what kids do, right? We'd go back there in hours and hours. We'd do things that we would never tell our moms we talked about. <laughs> we, we'd do that all the time. I don't like falling down from high places, okay? Neither do you? Okay, good. How many people like falling down from high places? Oh, a few people like falling, okay. Okay. Notice they're all under 20 years old, maybe, or something like that. I, 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 there, there was this water pipe, and this water pipe went across a cavern back in those woods. And, and my friend would just, he would just walk across it like this. I couldn't do that. I had to straddle it and, and go. Because I was terrified because, you know what? If anybody was going to fall, it was going to be me. I had to walk carefully, circumspectly, accurately, precisely. like when you go up a mountain and you're, the road is narrow. You know, one of the things I, I, I realize on, um, I just lost my complete trend of thought. Um, what's the road that I live off of? Let's see. Uh, oh, Wampler. Wampler. Well, Wampler. That, there, there's a place, the, the, around that corner, that place is so narrow that every time I go around and the car's coming around, I think I'm going to get hit. It's so narrow. It was like a place in my, my hometown, there was a, like a six lane road, but you could actually hand drinks back and forth with people in the car. It was the, it, the roads were that narrow. 
And when you're driving on those types of roads, you have to be careful about what you're doing. Our text says, if we're going to live in such a way that Christ is going to shine upon us, and because of that, the bubbling up of thanksgiving is going to be for God. We have to walk carefully. We can't live too fast. Many times we, 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 we're, we're busy. We're always in a hurry, aren't we? Many times. We're, we have to go here, we have to go there, we have to go here, we have to go there. The most, not, not as fast as you used to, huh? Okay. Is that what you, Okay. But we're still busy. You know, sometimes the only way to slow down is to really plan to walk carefully. It's even possible to do God's to do things in the name of God too fast. We we want to right the wrongs too fast. We want to try to win the world too fast. We want to we 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 speak too quickly. Yes, I do sometimes. Because we're 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 hasty and we're ill-timed. We go before we're ready, we speak before we have anything to say, we teach before we're taught. But what happens when you hurry? You don't watch where you're going. You just don't watch. Now, my friend said the best way to get across that pipe was to do it quickly and not look down. But I don't care what you said, it was much further than this, okay? I mean, I could, I, I'm not afraid of this height. But if I was standing up at the top of the ceiling and tried to jump down, I'd be kind of fearful of that. And, and, and so I, I, I couldn't help but look down and say, you know, that's where I'm going to be. If I hurry, that's what's going to happen. So, so our lives and how we walk in our lives determine if we're going to be thankful. If, if we get in a hurry, if we're, always in, if, if we're always trying to make things work out for us, we're never going to give thanks to God. We're never going to rest. Slow down. And see the glory of the Lord. That's number one. Number two. It says... Making the best use of your time, this is in verse 16, because the days of evil. In other words, redeem. Redeem the time. Redeem the time. Make the best use of your time. The word redeem means buying back. It's, you know, it's when you, when, when someone buys something from you and then you want it back, you have to pay to get it back. And that's, that's what redeeming the time is. The NIV uses the word not just making the best use or redeeming the time. It says making the best use of your opportunity. And that's a good word. Because, because time has basically two kind of ideas. I could say, what time is it? And you would say it is whatever time it is, right? 6 o'clock, 11.15, 12.30, 2 o'clock, be here at 5, be here at 7. All those type of things. But there's another word for time. And it's a time that it requires action. Now is the time, so to speak. The urgency of right now. I was reading recently um, one of the sermons by Martin Luther King. He said this. He, he said, We have come to this hallowed spot to be reminded, to remind America of the fierce urgency of right now. See, now is the time when it says, make the best. It means today is the day. Now is the time to make the decisions that are upon your heart and life. It's now. These are desperate times. These are times that you have to act not tomorrow, but today. Don't put it off, those things. And especially don't put off thanking God. And this is not only for during this time of the year. It's every day of your life. Don't put off thanking, re, relishing in, loving the Lord. 
Because you know, in the, in, in, the, in the next section it says, don't get drunk with wine. Don't act like what the world does because all the world wants to do is find something to thank and they thank the, the, the wine bottle. You know, sometimes they do. They, they say, that's the only way that I can make it through life is that wine bottle. He says, don't, be, don't get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. How is one filled with the Spirit? It's by faith. Being filled with the Spirit doesn't mean you have a certain experience. It doesn't mean that. What being filled with the Spirit means every area of your life is given over to the Spirit to control and to empower by faith. We have nothing on the ancient world. The ancient world, we, we think we live in the worst times in the world. That's not true. Think about what Paul was going through while chained in a Roman jail. I mean, the man by the name of Nero was emperor. He was a perverted king. He burned the city and then blamed Christians for it. And so what he did was he would actually take the Christians, put them on a pole, and light them on fire. You think we have it bad? Paul knew what it meant to be in a depressed world. Ephesians was a city given to heathenism. And Paul's day was one of the most important cities in the Roman province of Asia. It was, it was the place of interna interstate commerce. It was, it was like New York City today. And they had this, these temples to these gods of, 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 of fleshly pursuit because they needed to give thanks to something. And so what they would do is they'd, they would invent these gods of fleshly pursuits. Uh, gods of sex. God, the temple of Artemis or Diana by the Romans. See, we, we don't have anything on them. They had their lusts. They had their struggles. And, and they lowered their morals so low that they combined their lusts with astrology, black magic, sorcery, and perversion. We think we live in a bad time? Hmm. We live in a difficult time. We live in a depressing time. But what we have to do is thank God that we live in this time and we can make an action. We can redeem this time. We can redeem this time. That's what Paul meant when he said that these are evil days. Make the best use of your time. The days are not going to encourage you to give thanks to God. The, the days are not going to encourage you that things, you're going to look out on, the, on everything in the world and you're going to say, mm, well, maybe things are getting worse and worse. And we all, we all have that attitude. But let me say, to God, when, when God looks at this world, he's seen it in his control coming to an end for his children. And so when God is working and God is, is, is behind the scenes following everything that happens in our life, he would say, these are the days of opportunities for the children of God. The darker it gets, the greater opportunity God is seeing. You know, we don't make dark lights, do we? We make flashlights. Because what is, what is, what is dark? Dark is simply the absence of what? Light. I don't have a, I don't have a little thing here that I could go, and it would, there's a dark spot. We look at our world and we look at things and the way that, the reason why it's dark is the church needs to shine light. Amen. The days are evil, but we can redeem the days. We can be optimistic about the day because guess what? We have the God who is the power behind everything. Amen. We believe in a God who is almighty, who is beautiful, who is our creator 
who is who is everlasting. Our God is unchangeable. Our God is the forgiving God of the Bible. The cross is the symbol of God's affection. And no matter how dark it gets, the light will shine brighter. Don't be scared today to redeem the time. Last week I told I, I, I told you about interruptions and seeing them coming from God. Um, sometimes we have interruptions. Um, and, and when I was thinking about that, I thought, well, here I had an interruption in my week this week, and I took I took it. The last thing I wanted to do was to handle something, and I said, okay, God, I guess you want me to share the gospel. God's not surprised that where we are in the 21st century. God's not surprised. You see, we can watch our step. We can, we can redeem the time. And, and there are hard times, yes, that are, that, are, that are coming. They're coming. But we can all redeem the time. We can all give thanks to the Lord in everything we do. When you see someone that is less fortunate than you, you can give thanks. When you see someone that doesn't have the use of their legs, you can give thanks. When you see someone... But even the person that doesn't have their legs may have their hearing and their eyes and their tastes and their friends. We can all give thanks. We don't need to whine. You know what whining is? When we say, but I don't want to. Isn't that what whining is? Leave me alone, yes. You know? How, how many of us tend to whine during the day? When you find yourself whining, thank the Lord. Redeem the time. Redeem the time. And finally, do God's will. Look at verses, verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Let me ask you a question. Suppose God were to ask you this question. Which age would you like to live in? Would you like to live in the age of Egypt? Or the age of Greece or the Roman Empire? Or the Renaissance or the Protestant Reformation? Or the time of Abraham Lincoln? What age would you like to live in? Would you like to live into the, the tumultuous times of the 60s or the, or the times of the 70s? Or maybe you'd like to live back in the 80s today. No? Maybe some of you weren't here in the 80s. Uh, or maybe you'd like to live back in the 40s or the 30s or the 20s. Let me share with you A man I think got it. He said, if you allow me to live just a few years in the second half of the 20th century, I'll be happy. Now that's a strange statement to make because the world is all messed up. The nation is sick. Trouble is in the land. Confusion is all about. That's a strange statement. But I know somehow that only when it's dark enough can you see the stars. This person went on to say, well, I don't know what will happen now. We got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now. It doesn't matter because I've been at the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I'd like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm concerned about, I'm not concerned about that now. 
I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountaintop. I've looked over. I've, I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight, we as a people will get to the promised land. I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. The thing that impressed me, and the man that said this was Martin Luther King. But the thing that impressed me was said, I want to do the will of God. And, and, and people that are going to give praise to God have to say, no matter what is going on around us, we want to do the will of God. That's how we face the future. That's how we look at the future. That's how we become more optimistic about the future because we know in some sense, God's will will prevail. It prevailed on the cross. Jesus accomplished everything needed to save you. He forgave sinners of their sins. He took upon their sins upon the cross. He gave us his righteousness. He satisfied the wrath and anger of God. And he gives to his children joy everlasting. Remember, it says in the Bible, for the joy of my salvation is my strength. And it happens when we do the will of God. Joy comes when we do the will of God. I'll tell you, there's nothing more exciting than doing the will of God. It may be hard. But when you do it, the world can be dark, but the shining glory of Christ just gets you go, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to do the will of God. Jesus risen from the dead. We sit here celebrating a Savior and a Lord that is risen. So I'm optimistic about the future. I'm really optimistic about what God is doing in our midst. And I give thanks to the Lord. I, many of you could say, I, where I am today, I could not have planned my life. I would never have dreamed to be on the East Coast ever in my life. But knowing God's will gives me such peace and makes me thank Him. I thank my Lord. Sometimes, you know, I, I struggle with thanksgiving. But I thank my Lord for you. You all bless me. And I am very grateful. I am very grateful to be able to proclaim the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm very grateful. Listen to how the Lord in conclusion says that no matter what happens today, God will be true tomorrow. He says, be strong in the Lord and the strength of my might. The Bible says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. There is no rock like our God. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2. Those who are with us are more than are with them. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 23, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength and, every, and ever present help in trouble. Psalm 46, verse 1. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he has removed our transgressions from us. Psalm 103, verse 12. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives, tra forgives tra the transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance? Micah 7, verse 18. 
The Bible says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8 verse 31. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. 1 John 4 verse 4. I think you could be optimistic today if you are a thanks giver. You're thanking God for all that he's done. Yes, be encouraged. Let your, not your heart be troubled. Watch your step. Redeem the time. Seek God's will every day. Because when you glorify God as God, you give thanks for everything. When you can put, take up a, a bit of bread and a cup of cold water, you can say thank you. You are happy to make others happy. And you love the Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray today.